Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here, and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Now, today we are talking about buying small and micro businesses. This is an episode for our listeners out there who are looking to launch into business by buying one, and it's also for brokers who deal with the sale of small and micro businesses in identifying an often overlooked potential pool of buyers in people who are looking to launch out of employment and into owning their own business. So today to talk about this, we have on the show Hunter Leonard, who is the founder of the business Silver and Wise, a business that helps mature individuals who are starting or buying their first business at 40 or beyond. He is also the author of the best-selling book, Generation Experience. In this episode, Hunter and I discuss the opportunity for the Silver and Wise generation to look at buying a business as an alternative to employment. We look at what makes for a successful purchase, and we also look at some case studies of where this has all gone wrong to hopefully help you identify what business could work best for you. We also dig into some general tips and traps in making the big decision about whether to buy and what to buy, and at the decision between buying a business versus starting a business. So without further ado, let's chat to Hunter. Hi, Hunter. Thank you so much for coming on the Deal Room podcast today. You're most welcome, Joanna. Nice to be here. Great. Okay. Look, today is a bit of a different conversation. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about this perhaps um, a little bit unexplored pool of buyers that might be sitting out there. So maybe, Hunter, if you can just give us a quick overview, a bit of a background of who you are and what Silver and Wise does and, and why you're here, who you're serving. Yeah, totally. Well, our overall mission is is an end to ageism. So that's the long-term goal. The shorter term goal is to help mature age people who have been made redundant and or have decided to decided on a change of career slash lifestyle. Uh, there's a large number of this age group, 45 to 50 plus in Australia, who find it very difficult to get a new job at that age. And so they then, after a period of time, are starting to look at their other options. Um, And, of course, one of those options is uh, starting a business or buying a business. Uh, And many of the people we deal with, and per the Human Rights Commission in Australia, you've got more than 100,000 in this age group who are Mm. considered to be willing to work. In other words, they want to uh, continue working or they have to continue working. And in that group, there's a very significant group that are being uh, suffering from ageism. So people in that age group find it very difficult to get an interview for another job. Um, 68% of organisations in Australia have an age above which they won't hire and that's 50, Mm. despite the retirement age being in the high 60s now. So there's this gap between what age corporations will hire and what age people want to retire. (laughs) Uh, And because people are living longer, they actually want to retire later. So... Mm. A lot of people who are in their late 60s and early 70s are still very active, very energetic and still feel they have something to offer. So there is a a large and growing pool of people out there who are, I guess, because they're finding it difficult to get jobs in the corporate area, are now looking to other alternatives, whether whether it's the gig gig economy, so getting lots of short-term jobs and doing lots of things for lots of people, Mm. or actually formalising that into the structure of a business um, by buying, buying a franchise or buying a business from someone who wants to sell it. Or then, or starting their business from scratch, mm. and that's what we do. We help we help them consider how ready are they to start a business, and then also train them in the art of being a business owner, if you like. Mm, mm. Because I think it's a it's a good point that you make about the training of the art of being a business owner. Because I've certainly seen people, many people actually. I mean, over the years we've dealt with many, 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 many businesses that uh, where we've either acted for the buyer or the seller. But I've seen many instances where businesses have been purchased by people, whether or not it's people who are coming out of 
employment, them finding employment difficult or just want to run their own race mm. or are serial investors, so investing in um, buying businesses as, uh, as a form of investment, but mm. who are doing this in markets that they don't necessarily have a lot of knowledge in yeah. or perhaps not even knowledge about business itself. And, and it can look very easy from the outside to take a business that um, has a certain amount of revenue and profit and continue that or, or grow it. Of course, mm. everyone thinks that they can do better than the last person. <laughs> but then the reality is when they come in, it doesn't work that way. And we've, we've witnessed quite a few buyers turn around and then turn into sellers, you know, one or two or three years down the track when mm. they have found that the reality of business ownership hasn't met what their expectations are of it. So I think it's yeah. a really good point that you make about the importance of um, people understanding how to run a business before they're in business, whether they're buying a business or, or starting a business themselves. Yeah, yeah, totally. And we, we surveyed 10,000 business owners, so we've got a big survey group of understanding the challenges or, or if you like it, I've asked the question, what keeps you awake at night of a business owner? Then you get We've had 10,000 people answer those sorts of questions. And so what we did is we categorised that down to about to eight specific skill areas that a business owner needs. Um, and often people will think that a small business is less complex than a big business. But in fact, every business, no matter what size it is, has these areas that need to be handled. Um, so things and what like, are those areas? Hunter, tell us those areas. <laughs> one is being able to set goals and targets for the business mm. and then having a strategic plan to meet that. So this concept of um, there's a difference between a goal and a wish, right? If you, A wish is just something you hope for. A goal is something you set and then you act towards it with whatever set of activities you need to do. So that idea of strategic business planning is is an important skill. Connected to that is the ability to then understand your market which is your marketing um, so understand your customers and your and your market marketing and PR once it, once you start marketing to customers and you get people reaching for your services then you have to be able to sell to them so that that leads you into the selling and business development part of a business then there's the whole issue of managing money which is a big issue for many business owners cash mm. flow and mm. all of the legislation around running staff and superannuation and getting supplies to pay on time, getting customers to pay on time, you know, all those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, there's quality management. So so whatever product you're dealing with, what what quality are you aiming for? Um, you know, if you were selling a pen, you know, you could sell something that was a couple of dollars or you could sell something that was a couple of hundred dollars and both of them have different quality standards. Um, there's managing people. So whether you're dealing with suppliers or customers or your staff. Well, that's a big one, isn't yeah, it? Totally, totally. <laughs> and it, it's one that as an employee um, coming out of corporate, somebody yeah. may not may not have had experience. That They might have that's run right. a small team, but dealing with it in a small business, you've got not just the management of the person, but you've got the management of their contract and their pay and their super and all these other sorts of things that need to be done and legislation around that and, you know, policies on bullying, harassment and safety and it's quite a complex thing. Every small business needs to take care of their people mm. um, and deal with them with respect and integrity and, and, you know, and honesty and pay them the right level and we've all seen great examples of that recently in the news where all of these high-profile chefs and cafe owners have not been yeah. paying their staff well. So yeah. not necessarily because they're bad people, it's just because they don't get sometimes mm -hmm. what, what the legislation is related to that. So it can be quite complex. But as a business owner, you're responsible for it. So you've got to you've got to know what those things are. Yeah. And and I think, you know, I guess also to this point of the difference between perhaps working as a manager for an organization versus managing staff when you are when you have some real you know a financial pain or financials on the line mm. at the end of the day you know because there's a real difference between your feelings about performance but also retention as well yes. the the whole concept of retention when it's your butt that's on the line at the end of the totally. day when, totally. you know, it's your, when profit and loss, you know, means your profit or your loss. Mm. So, um, so, so I think that's certainly a really good point about the difference yeah. 
being within a business and operating the business itself as the owner rather than, you know, from an employed management perspective. Yeah, exactly. So ultimately, as a manager, you know, if you're a middle management in corporate, there's always something, you've got some resource and support mm. around you. Um, you've probably got somebody who you report to. So at some point, the board takes responsibility. But when you're running a small business, you you are the board, you are the CEO, um, you're also the general manager, you're also the bottle cleaner and the dishwasher and the mm. garbage bin emptier and all those things. So whatever role that you are playing, you're ultimately responsible for it. Um, so it's your your backside on the line so to speak mm. and what we find when we've you know I've had hundreds of conversations with people who are starting businesses or buying businesses or otherwise is that many people are quite uh, what we call a technical specialist so they've had a career in a particular stream whether it be HR or marketing or sales or um, finance or, or maybe operations or something so they, they have a deep skill in one part of the business so they're going to be really good at that so if they've been making violins all their life they'll be a really good violin maker <laughs> mm, mm. but it doesn't mean they're going to be a good business owner mm. to be a business owner you have to be a general manager which means you you have to understand these eight areas that we talk about it doesn't mean you have to do it but you have to know they exist for a starting mm. point you have to know that there is a part of your business which is all about managing money there's a part about managing quality there's a part about managing people so Either you build your own skills in doing it or you find an expert who can support you to mm. do it or you put in some kind of system, um, mm. technology or, and, you know, the classic example is cash flow. You know, most people use Xero or QuickBooks or Myob these days in a cloud-based solution, which is a much easier way of managing your money than you might have done with the old shoebox or the receipts years <laughs> ago. Um, but every part of your business needs to have some kind of zero like system or technology or person or yourself who, who's over it and, and in control of it and as a small business owner you're kind of bouncing between these eight areas all the time you just got but you've got to know they exist otherwise you get stuck in one which is looking after the client <laughs> yeah. and then all these other things collapse around you which is what happens to most small business owners they suddenly have a an emergency issue with money because they haven't sent their invoices out on time or they haven't yeah. the money or they didn't deliver the service for the client in the first place so there's no way they're going to pay the invoice so something's mm. gone out because in in the real world if you do what you promised most people are likely to pay you there might be yeah. some, there might be some bad people out there that are going to take you for a ride but generally most people are sociable and once they're happy they've got a service they'll give you the money for that service well so. to the extent that they can pay and of course yeah of course yeah of course they, they might be as well. they might be in similar situations to the business owner we're talking about because you've got small mm. business dealing with small business but no it doesn't completely avoid the the problem because your business may still run into a cash flow issue but the point is what i'm saying is that there's there's elements which can make it more easy to handle just knowing when you're going to send invoices out every month we, we had a client recently who started, actually a friend of mine who actually went to work as a general manager for another business. This guy had $2 million in outstanding work that he'd done that the customers had picked up and taken away, but he hadn't invoiced. Wow. So there's no way he was going to be able to, hadn't actually invoiced. So there was $2 million worth of work that had gone out the door that hadn't been invoiced because he was too busy just doing the stuff of getting things out the door and he, his invoices had just backed up and backed up. So the first thing this a uh, friend of mine did was went in and basically pulled all of the worksheets out and got an invoice out and they were able to collect I think 1.8 of the two million dollars within about six Jeez, years. that's incredible just sitting there in unbuilt turn this guy's life on. he was able to go and buy a new business a new warehouse and because there was all this money for the stuff he delivered everyone was happy yeah the only bit that they couldn't collect was stuff that was just too old and the customers had said well that's last year we, we it's too late now we can't yeah. <laughs> We didn't know we owed you and we don't have the money, so sorry, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So so then reflecting back on, on that discussion that we've had about mm. all of these areas that business owners need to be on top of and that, and that potentially people who are coming out of corporate and into business, whether they're buying it or starting it for themselves, you know, perhaps don't have their head around. Have, have you got some examples um where uh, you've dealt with clients that have gone into buying a business uh, 
where it's worked really well and maybe an example of one where, where it didn't work so well. So maybe we can have a look at what those characteristics are or, or the differences between the two. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So um, the, the really good example I'll tell you about is um, one of the guys who sort of was one of our early people we mentored. He has been in the uniform and safety equipment market for years, operating as a sales manager for a big uh, franchise group. Mm. And he decided, as it turned out, the franchise group wanted to sell one of their stores to take it out of the franchise network. And he's, he decided he wanted to buy that store. So he has gone through the process of working with the franchisor to buy the store and take it out of the branded network, still supplying with the franchisor, supplying some of the the um, uniforms and basically um, workwear and things like that. Um, so he's gone from gone from a, an employed position as a sales manager into running a business that he knows very very well. Mm. Um, so he was he was already starting with a really strong understanding of how these businesses operated, mm. uh, the sort of profit they made, the amount of uniforms they sold, their customers. So he knew the tradies that would come into these stores um, and he's gone exceptionally well mm. uh, with that business. Now, our mentoring with him was more about all marketing and other things that he didn't really have a handle on, but he was able to, the core of the business, he understood the business model, he understood the profitability, he understood stock turns, he understood the product itself, he, he had a good relationship with the people supplying the product to him um, and he knew what the store was already doing so he had a good due diligence on the the profit and loss of the store already. So mm. he, he could see opportunity to grow it in an area where he had expertise that the current owner didn't. Yes. So he's, he's gone really well um, and basically the, the business has grown ever since he took it over. So. Yep. That was, a, that was a really good example of someone who had um, the knowledge, understanding, awareness, appreciation of the business model and some background in it. And just and stopping and focusing on that example for, yeah. for the moment, I guess, you, you know, the, the benefit for him is he's taken um, something that he was probably doing for someone else and now turned this into something that he's doing for himself in a way that not only can he earn a wage, hopefully, greater than what he was earning before, but whatever. But but now also building this equity in something yes, that then exactly. has a, a value at sale of, you know, a multiple of the amount of profit that he's able to make. So, totally. you know, turning what was an employment situation where you just get what you get and then that's yep. it to something that really is building value so I guess that's really where where the benefit is for moving out of an employment and into buying a business in that particular situation exactly uh, particularly exactly. where it went well <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then if we contrast it with where it's not going so well maybe t- tell us an example along that line yeah well one one example and, and we actually didn't mentor this this person but I heard the story in full because I interviewed them on our podcast uh-huh <laughs> And uh, they were they had purchased a franchise for a swim school, mm-hmm. um, which and that franchise included the franchisor coming and building the pool in an mm. industrial warehouse location and giving them basically the systems of how to run run the business. Mm. Um, they <laughs> they just ran, there was all sorts of troubles with this one. Um, the franchisor didn't deliver on what they promised um, fully. They ended up with half a half baked business with with elements that they hadn't been taught about how to do like the marketing and the PR <laughs> there was mm. no marketing model there was no marketing plan mm. um, and then as it turned out the whole franchise system collapsed so they were left with having spent quite a significant part of their redundancy payment in buying this opportunity which looked on paper to be quite strong um, but the risk there was there was a lot of risks in that the risks were at the franchise or level where they weren't stable and mm. so that you, if you're going to buy a franchise then you've got to understand there's a, there's two elements of due diligence there's due diligence on whether that actual individual location is doing okay but there's also got to be due diligence on whether the franchisor is going okay so yeah. things like you know are they up to speed on their super payments are they mm. are they up to speed with the existing franchisors can you interview the existing franchisors or franchisees mm. I should say to see mm. what the relationships like you know there's a lot a lot of things that this 
unfortunately, this person didn't really realise that they had because they thought, well, I'll buy a franchise, everything's sorted for me because that's what franchising is supposed to be about. Mm. And there's many good franchises out there. And many not so good as well. <laughs> and many not so good. So, um, yeah. But from a cautionary tale perspective, um, if you, my, my view is we talk about these eight areas, is really you've got to build your understanding and your skill in these eight areas because knowledge is power. Yeah. The more you know about the business, the business model, the risks, the trends, all of these other things, the more you're able to protect yourself, particularly if you're going to take, I mean, business is risky. Yeah. All business is risky. There's no doubt about it. It takes a certain special human, I think, to go out and have a crack at running a business. Um, <laughs> maybe slightly crazy human. But, um, For us who like to live on the edge. Yeah. <laughs> but as a community, we need people that are willing to do that because we need people that are willing to be business owners and then we need people that are willing to be employees. You need all of these parts in a, in a really good um, thriving economy and a, and a civil society, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we need these risk takers and we need to support them but um, sometimes things don't go right. Mm. Uh, you have to be aware of it as an individual. So they, what I guess what I'm saying is that if you're going to take the decision to be a business owner, then don't just do it with your eye, one eye closed or both eyes closed. You've got to wade into it and really understand it before you buy one. Mm. And I guess that's how you help your you help you act for buyers and sellers, but you're help trying to help both parties get a, a win win. Yeah. Um, whether you're acting for the buyer or the seller, yeah, I'm sure absolutely. your your approach is a win win. Yeah, that's right. Um, but that's not always the case. Mm. <laughs> so mm. for your listeners, it's a case of saying, well, if you're going to go and buy a business or if you want to sell a business, well, you know, just help both parties connect all the dots because yeah. leave it, it, the concept of leaving something on the table for the next person is a good one to think about. Or yeah. you give them a business, you're, you're ready to sell, but you give them a business with a bit of upside and then they can then go and be successful as well. And um, it's sort of pass, passing it forward, I suppose, or paying it forward. Yeah, it's, it's interesting as I reflect on the differences that you've talked about in in these two um, business buyers. Uh, mm. And obviously, there's quite an extreme difference in the outcome. Yes. Um, but it seems that some of the lessons that can be taken from that are the um, you, you know the benefit of either you yourself fully understanding the industry that you're going into or at least having advisors, someone around yeah. you, a team around you who are able to provide enough advice for you to be able to shine a light in far enough to be able to understand past yes. that first layer. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think the second component, and I don't know if this was related at all in your examples as well, but the second component that I have seen um that is relevant is, is people having perhaps this this um, romantic notion of what it, it might be like to own a particular type of business, perhaps in an industry that they've not been involved in um, heavily in the past. You know, I've seen a number of examples of this, um, mm-hmm. and and it just it pains me because sometimes I feel like I can see on the outside, you know, what could happen but of course most people are very confident in their own abilities um, and they don't necessarily take enough time to step back and really reflect on whether or not a love of something is going to translate into um, a good business being able to make a good business out of something and I've seen this you know in um, some examples I recall in the uh, hospitality industry, I think that's an example of an industry that looks better on the outside than perhaps it is on the inside to run um, and retail as well. I, I think that can that can look better on the outside than on the inside of, yeah. uh, you, you know, of a particular type of thing that you perhaps have a, a love of but uh, doesn't necessarily translate into it good business and and so I guess in the two examples you were talking about the the person who had stuck within the same industry you know had known enough about the industry not just to know that they were getting a good deal on the business itself but also once they are integrated into the business they were able to run it to its best advantage rather than you know, get into the business and then suddenly realise you've actually got no idea how to run the uh, the thing. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think um, to your point about loving the idea of a business, um, 
I, I firmly believe that having a passion for the the type of business is is important. What's more important though is having a passion for the type of customer, mm. because if you can't see yourself, for example, dealing with I don't know sixty five year old men every day, mm. and they're the main client of the business, if they if that the idea of that doesn't even get you excited. <laughs> then I would be walking, you no, know, running away at a million miles an hour because <laughs> you have to. You have to realize that every business involves dealing with customers. Yeah. Um, and there is going to be an ideal type of customer for that business. So you you'd want to know who that was before you even bought a business. One of the great examples I heard is somebody who'd come out of corporate and they decided they they loved the idea of running a cafe, but what they hadn't actually sat down and realized that they hated making coffee and they hated talking to people. <laughs> so not a good idea if you're going to run a business and you don't like the two things that are important in that business. Yeah, know? yeah. And, you know, and some people will look to buy business like that because they think that they can run it as an investment and be hands-off and, and run it through the staff. That's okay. That's a different role. You know, an investor is a different role. That's a dispassionate, uh, how much money can I make out of this? Can I... Uh, improve it and and flip it for a profit. Yeah, you know, in a period of time. But if you're actually going to step in and be the the face of the business or the business owner, then somehow, somewhere, you're going to have to understand all of the dynamics of that business. Not necessarily all of them from day one, but you just got to realise that to the extent that you're weak in one of those areas, it will increase the time to pay off. Yeah, because if you're poor at managing people and yet the business has staff, then then you've got to add the time for you to get good at managing people before you're going to get the best out of those people to get the growth because they're the ones driving the growth. And if you're poor at marketing, well, you're going to add the time for you to get to a point where you understand how to market your business to the time when it becomes effective and grows your business. So, And that's what we're seeing is in these big surveys of all these customers and also you know, frankly, in dealing with business owners for the last 20 years in our marketing business, which is a separate business, is that the things where the business owner are weak are always going to be the weak points. Yep. And every weak point you have in a business slows down the ability to make money because it's either costing you time or money to handle that all the time. A quality issue, for example, if you're always handling quality, quality issues and people are sending product back and it just adds time to you handling all of those issues, whereas if you're absolutely fantastic at quality and every time a customer gets the product, it's perfect and they love it, then there's no additional time and energy put into repairing stuff all the time. Not only that, because everyone loves it, you're going to get word of mouth, so the Mm. business is going to be growing. So um, it's just, I know it's a fairly pragmatic approach, it's just saying that every business is the same, every business has bits and pieces to it that you need to know. And the faster you get to know them, the faster you get control and knowledge of them, the quicker the business will perform. Fabulous. Well, look, um, I I think this has been a really useful discussion today, hopefully useful to our listeners out there who might be thinking of uh, acquiring a business. Uh, And and I guess maybe we can just round out the discussion. I, I guess you probably deal with people who are making this decision between buying a business and starting a business. Yeah. What, what are some of the, you, you know, really quickly, just a quick overview of the things people should consider if they're tossing up those two um, options? Uh, first thing we always say is just financial readiness. Like how are you placed in order to buy that business and then run it and understand where the return's going to be and how long it's going to be? So starting a business from scratch, it could take 6, 12, 24 months for you to actually even draw a wage out of it. So have you got the resources behind you to be able to start something and then live off whatever you've got as funding, whether it's a loan or your own redundancy payment or super or whatever you're doing? Um, If you're buying the business, how quickly are you going to get a return on the investment? So the financial readiness to actually tip some money into a Mm. business. Then skills readiness, it's what what are the skills I'm going to need are they covered by existing staff in the business or am I going to have to actually learn them mm. when I buy the business? Because if the existing owner is going, you know, you're buying a business and the existing owner is going, well, all of a sudden you're in there. Mm. How, what's the transition period? So I always talk about this idea of skills. And then the the last thing that I always say is really important is just understand what's happening in that industry. Um, mm. To take a classic example, if you were making buggy wheels for a, for a horse and cart and everyone's buying cars, well, don't go and buy a horse and cart business, you know, because it's going out backwards. 
I, I've heard examples of people going and buying video stores. I was going, I was just, <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. And then I so, thought, well, I won't go there. But yes, you're right. Except for examples. <laughs> for, exa- for example. So for example. just understand what's, what's going to happen. Is this, mm. is there some major change going to happen in that industry in the next, you know, so let's say it was two years out um, and something major had happened overseas and that trend was coming to Australia. Well, I probably wouldn't buy the business if there was a five-year turnaround for me to get payback on it because I'm. And, guess, go- and, and the point yeah. here is that maybe, uh, maybe also try to be a really well-read about what what the f- the predictions are for the future of the mm. industry as well. Like you, yeah, you know, exactly. like get amongst it, see what's happening overseas, see if you can yeah. work out where the trends are. Yeah. Um, so because I think that that is one element that sometimes people don't necessarily think about being aware of um, making themselves aware of the possibilities where that of where that particular industry might be heading. Yeah, totally, totally. So they're, they're the, really the three key things and then it gets into more depth if you then go ahead, <laughs> you know, get, get good legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, look, Hunter, thank you so much for coming um, onto the podcast to talk to us today. You mentioned you have a podcast as well. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the podcast, uh, we basically just interview people who've who are 45, 50 and over who've actually gone out and done something successful and we just talk to them about what road, the journey they went on and what they ran into and sort of some of its cautionary tales and some of its, you know, wonderful stories of uh, inspiration and ideas that they've come up with. Um, Love it. We've interviewed some really cool people, so if any of your listeners have got some cool ideas, we're always happy to talk to them and, and they can be inspirational role models for others. Love it. And what's the name of the podcast? It's called The Over 40 Business Show. The Over 40 Business Show, and presumably yeah. uh, our listeners will be able to find that on um, Apple Podcasts and all yeah. of their favourite other podcast players, whatever they are exactly. these days. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. Okay. Well, Hunter, if people want to get in contact uh, with you to find out a little bit more about what you do and how you might be able to help them, how can they do that? Uh, probably the best way is either just LinkedIn uh, because I publish all of my articles and all my thoughts on there. So they can just find me on LinkedIn. There's not too many Hunter Leonard's around, so they should be able to find me. <laughs> um, or silverandwise.com.au. Lovely. Yeah. Excellent. And if you are running along the beach right at this moment or driving along in your car on the commute to or from work or your business, um, all you need to do is pop into the show notes when you stop and uh, you'll be able to link straight through to Hunter. We'll put a link through there. Well, Hunter, I just want to say a massive thank you. Thank you for coming on the show today. More than welcome, Joanna. Well, that's it for our episode today with Hunter Leonard from Silver and Wise. In this episode, we talked all about looking to launch into a business by buying one and particularly for mature individuals who are buying their business at 40 or beyond. So I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like more information about this topic or you would like to get a link through to Hunter so that you can make contact with him, then simply check out our show notes or head over to our website at www thedealroompodcast.com. There you will also be able to find details of how to contact our lawyers at Aspect Legal if you or your clients would like to discuss any legal aspects of sales or acquisitions. And finally, if you enjoyed what you heard today, then don't forget to hit subscribe. Well, that's it. Thanks again for listening in. You've been listening to Joanna Oki and the Deal Room podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. Aspect Legal has a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready. We've also got a range of services to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisitions process. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. We provide a free consultation to discuss your proposed sale or acquisition. So see our show notes on how to book a time to speak with us or head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au.
Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. That will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to the Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au. Thank you.